fast forward um, to 18 months later, I had 36 stores, was financially free. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Lindsay Lovell. Lindsay, how are you doing today? I'm great, Todd. Thank you so much. Excited to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, appreciate uh, you joining us. And Lindsay is the CEO of Millionaires March. Lindsay, uh, why don't you give our listeners a little bit about your background? And then I want you to tell us something like unique that you just don't tell everybody. Okay. Okay. So a little bit about my background. I started off climbing the corporate ladder in the worlds of private equity and consulting, having been a straight A student in undergrad and thought, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, what you should do. You go and you'll get a title and a job and you'll have the American dream. Mm -hmm. And um, living in San Francisco, I thought maybe it's just an expensive city. And it just kind of hit me that, you know, even going back, getting my MBA, getting a pay raise, still wasn't going to get out of uh, the rat race, just saving to my 401k. And had this moment of realization one day checking my 401k with my paycheck being like, okay, maybe if I, you know, can eke out this much, I can have a comfortable retirement, maybe at 65 and maybe live until 95 comfortably. And it was just sort of depressing. And I had this moment of, I've got to do something differently. Um, And it timed nicely in the sense that that's when COVID came along. So I suddenly had extra time on my hands. And my husband introduced me to a great uh, mentor who took me under their wing and started to teach me about real estate investing. So that was May of 2020. And by July, I, thanks to his guidance and just diving in, had bought my very first rental property. And then fast forward um, to 18 months later, I had 36 stores, was financially free. Um, I now have over 72 properties personally under the Millionaire's March. I've started a couple syndications um, with a partner. And then I've also started the Millionaire's March coaching program to help bring everything that I learned along the way, um, specifically to women, uh, women women-led community, but happy to take anybody that's interested um, and learn how to get going and scale quickly. Love it. What is unique that you just like, you know, something you don't say on every podcast? Yeah. So um, I am originally um, from two ski bums, um, you know, and they they, uh, were very much entrepreneurial. And I spent my whole life giving them a little bit of grief and saying, that's crazy. You're taking... Uh, big leaps of faith and was very, very anti, never in a million years would I have thought I would take this risk. It was not, I was not one of those who was a serial entrepreneur. So the fact that I'm here doing this um, is shocking and was totally out of my comfort zone. Although people, you know, would never guess now given, you know, how comfortable um, I am. So I think the fact that I was not a diehard born entrepreneur and kind of went in kicking and screaming is unique from other people in this industry. It's funny. So your parents were both entrepreneurs? Yeah. Yeah. My, and, you know, my, yeah. Did, and they didn't teach, did they like push it or did they try to teach you about entrepreneurial? Like wh- why would you coming from two entrepreneurial parents, you just think, well, that's what, of course, that's what you're going to do. Right. But why, why do you think it wasn't? Yeah. You know, I mean, both when I started young, they were, were in corporate and then I saw my dad go off to be entrepreneurial. And even, you know, uh, even when he was working for corporate was always, you know, in the garage, trying to think of new notebooks and sending us to school with them. And they would fall apart, you know, because he was trying to have one that wrapped up quickly. And I think maybe seeing the struggle and the time and the things that didn't always work as a kid Mm -hmm. and being a bit of the guinea pig, maybe was a bit of a turnoff. Like, oh man, this is a lot of work. And, you know, dad's back in the garage tonight for another three hours, tinkering away, Um, and you know, his company, when he did officially start one, something completely different, you know, down in the basement, not glamorous. Um, it's interesting. They never forced it on me and I was good at school. And so they were comfortable being, you're going to go be the dentist and you're going to, you know, take over the family practice of the uncle and the grandfather. And it just wasn't something that, that they pushed on me, which, you know, for better or worse. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I ended up here. You ended up here. So I, it, it sounds like it ended up working out, but it just a roundabout way, you know, it just, it seems like, Hey, if you, I got entrepreneurial parents, like that's the dream, right? <laughs> Cause they're going to teach yeah. me that. Yeah. Uh, well, cool. So I, I want to go back to that, uh, you know, that moment that you realize or kind of time period where you're looking at your 401k and you're, looking at this and going, well, maybe if I work till 65, maybe, maybe just maybe if I lived to 95, I can make it. And, you know, so many people I think are thinking that way and they think, well, well, and, they, and I don't know if you were thinking, oh, we can cut expenses. And a lot of people think that way too. Well, we'll cover it. We won't live as like we're living right now and we can cut expenses and we can get there. But the other thing is now we've realized that's with like less than 2% inflation. And all of a sudden you get, you know, a time period where you've got six, seven, eight, 9% inflation. And that really quickly eats at your buying capability. And then if you get stuck in that, if somebody retired at 65 and they retired in what, 2021 or even 2022, they're sitting here going, oh crap. Like yeah. I retired, I thought I was going to be okay, but now living till 95, it looks like it can only live till 82 or whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and or I got to go get it. Your lifetime short. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's not, not an option. <laughs> right. It's not an option. So definitely. So you went out, did you, have you quit um, your job? Completely. So I'm I'm very fortunate in that I I love my job. Yeah. Um, I call on and educate uh, nurses and doctors in breast cancer centers. Nice. Um, and so until it becomes a job um, that it feels like a job, I'm able to still do it and and coach and have that flexibility. Um, but you know what's been interesting is I loved it, but in the back of my mind, I always thought, okay, sales reps, they're going away. We're being replaced. We're in, and I used to have a lot of fear about loving what I do, mm. but knowing I may not be able to retire from it. And now knowing that if I wanted to retire tomorrow, I could, I'm doing it because I love it. And if that change in industry does come about, it's okay. It doesn't worry you anymore. Am I keeping me up? Mm-mm. Yeah. And that's the beauty of what you created is you don't have to worry about losing your job. You don't have to worry about getting fired. You don't have to worry about the industry changing anymore. You like what you do. You want to keep on doing it. But if something happens, you've created a lifestyle, you've created a business that can support you without it. So you're okay. And I think that should be everybody's goal, right? That that should be everybody's goal, whether you like it, because some people love their jobs and, and they don't want to ever quit. I talked to plenty of people that are, are like that. I I have a lot of investors that are like that. I have uh, a lot of people I talk to all the time that are like, they love their job. They don't want to quit it, but they want to create some sort of financial freedom so they don't have to worry like you just said. And they don't have to sit here going at 65, maybe, maybe I'll be okay. You know, that's not what we want. <clears throat> so 72 rental properties, are these properties, are these uh, like single families? Are they duplexes? Are they Airbnbs? Like what what kind of properties are they? Yeah. So I uh, am big on diversification. You still have that conservative bone in my body. So really big on diversifying in markets, diversifying in assets, diversifying in, you know, what money pools I'm pulling from to invest. Um, So it started off with a single family home and did the Burr method, forced forced value. Um, The next one was a duplex. And then from there, I really like, even though it's not the sexy thing that you always hear, you know, the people at big stage center talking about the multifamily, the single family has really been a bit of my sweet spot and under four units. Although yesterday I did just close on selling um, an eight plex that I owned in Murray, Kentucky, which was the largest apartment that I have. But uh, now the the biggest is five doors. Um, Do have several Airbnbs and the syndication company that I started with a partner uh, is actually focused around buying multiple Airbnbs per fund in different markets. We're shifting now just because of the way market is and waiting to see a bit about how uh, more regulations turn with Airbnb, shifting more to our funds to long-term. But we have about 15 Airbnbs under management between what I own personally and um, in the syndication. 
So explain explain to me. Let's go into detail a little bit on this fund and, and the the short term rentals. Um, you you mentioned uh, she, it's shifting. Like, what do you mean by that? Like, let's let's dive in a little bit because I've heard some. That's not my niche, right? So I don't know. So I, you're honestly just educating me right now. Yeah. Um, so I want to be educated because I've heard some rumblings about short term rentals and. Um, I don't know. I, I'm going to have the statistics all wrong, but, you know, so many percentage are, 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 you know, no longer getting leased or rents are going down and stuff like that. Is is that what you're talking about or what, what are you seeing in that industry? Yeah, a little a little bit of both. There there was this article that went out and all of us were like, OK, it's not quite there, you know, but it had these yeah. you, significant well, of course, numbers. Of course, it, it, yeah. it's there to get clicks, right? It's like, let's make something up and let's see how many people actually fact check to yes. and how many people will sleep overnight, you know, yeah. not yeah. realize not everything you see on the web is true. Shocking. So um, what, was, what was that about? And, and what kind of truth is there to that, though, to that? Yeah. Argument? Now, it was about how occupancy rates are down. And that is absolutely true. And we've okay. seen that in, in different markets. And we are, like I said, in across different markets. So it's not just like we're in one and that's down. And what, what type of market uh, are you uh, in? Like, yeah. are you in um, more vacation rentals or are you in like business rental, like cities, uh, like w- what kind of, or is it all over? Yeah, it's, it's all over. So again, part okay. of that diversification, the first one I ever bought was in Kansas city, Missouri. And um, sure. I had to have my agent, you know, kind of educate me a little bit on the fact that not everybody wants to vacation in California or New York or, you know, that people come to the Midwest and there's different reasons. So we have quite a few in Kansas City, Missouri, and then we do have the vacation areas like the Smoky Mountains um, on the beach in North Carolina, um, Asheville, uh, Mississippi. So we really did try to go into a variety um, and balance it out with those kind of tried and true, not sexy markets like a Kansas City with a Smokies. Yeah. Is there, is there one that's more profitable or I guess more favorable for you? You know, it, it really just depends. Kansas City, and this is, I think, why we're backing off a little bit. Kansas City really was um, one that we were doing well in, in terms of what mm-hmm. you can buy a property there for and what you can make in the summer. And if you, you know, decorate it right, might have the right management. But um, literally on May 15th, they had been going to where they were going to make the permitting process easier and help the city profit from it. And then they suddenly turned around, did a complete 180 and said, you have 30 days notice. If you're not permitted, you can no longer rent. Hmm. Wow. And we had been working and went through that process and helping them create the permits. And then, you know, over 30 days, they're like, if it hasn't already been through, you're done. And so, yeah. um, you know, learning to pivot, looking at different ways, um, you know, and then there's the Smokies, which was also really profitable, but everybody else jumped in. That. Part yeah. of it has been to the lesson and just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. It Would you, like, as you're looking now, is it more markets that are tried and true and maybe not like this? I wouldn't say the Smokies were the hot like all of a sudden overnight. Smokies have been good for a long time, but it felt like everybody that I talked to that does short-term rentals were buying in the Smokies, like everybody. It is it, would you like, is that like, what, I guess maybe instead of putting words in your mouth, what is, what is your target? Like, what are you looking at today and ideally kind of moving forward? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, we're shifting to long-term because I think there's a lot of potential still back there, even with the rates are high, I like to say. Long-term, long-term meaning rentals. like so year away. plus leases? Mm-hmm. Got, it. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Now, if I were to work with, uh, you know, somebody that was hoping to get into the short-term rentals, you know, you always need to make sure that you're buying, you know, the best location. So if you're on the beach, you know, it's got to be on there. You've got to be ready to decorate and have it really stand out and be unique yeah. in today's market. And going into markets that aren't known and sexy. So we have two homes in Gulfport, Mississippi, which people kind of were like, who wants to own? But And one that we bought for maybe 200, 240,000 is, you know, bringing in 8,000 a month. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, just got lucky a little bit. It's two units, one bed. So you, you kind of also have to try it out um, about what works in that market. 
And then, you know, we other one, we made sure to go big, painted it pink and it has a pool, you know, so it's the pink house. So it's unique. It stands out. It's big. You know, you can't, yeah. it's no longer just buy, buy a house in, in the neighborhood and yeah, set you it. You got to do something special. You got to create an experience or an environment or something that people, it sticks out, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny you talk about like Kansas City. Uh, my wife and I, this is years ago, but yeah, we were like, we had our young daughter and we didn't want to fly. And we're like, what can we get to within 10 hours of our house? And we just like mm -hmm. kind of looked at the map and went, Kansas City, Missouri. Boom. Let's go there. We've never <laughs> spent time there. So we drove down to Kansas City, Missouri, stayed in, I don't know, it was at, this was a long time ago. So it was really before short term rentals became a thing, but stayed in a hotel and just hung out in Kansas City. I, we had no agenda, but it's just funny, like vacation. You don't think of K Kansas City as a vacation place, but. But then the municipality thing is really important. I think listeners need to understand, like Minneapolis did something similar to Kansas City, which is where I live. And they all of a sudden, I think you couldn't own more than like two or three vacation rentals. So some people that had like 10, 12, 15, they could no longer legally have those. Yeah. It didn't, no, they didn't grandfather it in or anything. It was just, you can't have more than three or whatever it was. Okay. And you're, yeah. That's it. Like, and, you know, in, in Kansas City, the rumor is that somebody that owns boutique hotels and expensive apartment complexes came in and, you know, because it was all going, we were working as a community and just literally overnight, yeah. you know, so uh, people with other interests and, you know, it often, we sometimes get bad reputations, but, you know, we're just a small business ourselves, most Airbnb owners, you know, so we're not out there, private equity making a ton of money. Um, it just happens to be using houses for our business and, and that causes a little bit more controversy than maybe the typical brick and mortar store. Yep. Well, let's dive into your syndication and, and what you're doing there. So you've got a syndication, you're buying more long-term um, single families. Is it exclusively single families? Like explain to me the type of property you're buying and then what's the goal and and with with that? Yeah. Yeah. So for both, whether it's going to be for my investors and my syndication or for my own um, personal portfolio, um, I still like to see if there is value add opportunity. So I'm closing this week on a property in um, Enid, Oklahoma, which is um, a military base. So um, enjoy being around there because of the, the steady type of tenants that you get. Um, I am not one that goes in and tears down walls and does, you know, adding square footage. For sure. me, that's just not been my my sweet spot. Um, but this one will be uh, cosmetic um, updates and then turning the garage into a fourth bedroom. So seeing an opportunity like that, knowing you just have to put in a split level, forcing that that value, you know, working with my agent to understand will a 4-1, you know, still rent versus a 3-1, what can I get for it? And is the value add there running those numbers? So that's really where our sweet spot is. Um, with our investors, so the ones that we're buying for our funds, they tend to be a little bit more turnkey um, because we like to get our investor money working right away. But if there is a quick opportunity to do value add, you know, paint cosmetics, um, update a few things, then then we will do that. But otherwise, we're really looking to try and find something that's a little bit over that 1% in markets that have, you know, very reasonable taxes. Um, and right now, one of the things we're really having to work hard on is finding um, reasonable insurance because insurance yeah. is really changing right now. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. Yes. It's ridiculous. Um, man, I've got some some friends that their insurance costs have literally quadrupled uh, and real estate taxes too. Uh, but it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I've, I've got a friend that they, they were paying 250 bucks a unit. They're now paying 1800 bucks a unit, um, in insurance costs everywhere. And that's without claims. It's crazy. So yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely things you have to juggle is what, what are your expenses look like and make sure you're on top of those. Cause it's really easy to look at a property and miss a couple expenses. And especially when we're talking, well, even multifamily doesn't matter, but single family, multifamily, if you're if you're just a little bit off, you can that can create a big difference in your overall cash flow. And and now that all of a sudden that good investment turns into a yeah, probably should have bought that building for that price. Yeah. Um I, and I'm assuming then so you're doing this syndication or is it a fund and you're purchasing properties into that, putting that into those fund? Exactly. Exactly. So 
Lindsay, how are you juggling all of this? I mean, you're you're doing a lot. You're working full time, and you've got seventy two properties. You've got your coaching business. You've got the syndication company that you're um, moving on now. How are you juggling all of this and keeping sane? <laughs> well, I think that the number one thing is. Um really letting go of the, I have to do it myself. It's cheating if I don't. And, you know, if you haven't heard of the phrase or read the book, who, not how run out, get it, read it, you know, and get comfortable with delegating. Um, I, my gift to myself this year was that I finally um, hired a full-time virtual assistant who Hmm. is a, a godsend and no way I could be accomplishing what I'm accomplishing. Um, without her and just being comfortable things in life that, you know, I look and I say, is it worth it for me to clean versus hiring somebody, you know, outsourcing if it is something, but am I going to be productive and use that time creating, generating, or building at least not not necessarily money, but life wealth in some way, is it worth outsourcing that? And can I put money towards doing that? Um, I also think, you know, having, partnered with other people, one of my, my strengths and that I've started from the very beginning is just being very organized, drag and drop, have folders, have a system and how you label things, because it's shocking how often you have to go back and find this deed or that document or this, you know, and if you're not organized, you can waste half your day when it should only take you three, four, five seconds. So systems and, and finding a right team. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I need to work on that I just was like thinking about actually today is you get all these emails and so many of the emails are just not that important or it's like an attachment or a document and you look at it and you're like, okay. And you just kind of put it to the side. And today, it, this, it ha- this happened twice today. I'm looking for a specific document and I don't know, I can't really think of how I can search effectively for it in my email. And it's taking me forever to find the stupid document. And yeah. so it took probably the first, the first one was the most frustrating. That probably was 25 minutes of my time before I found it. The second one probably got, it took me five minutes, but even five minutes, it was like, this is ridiculous. I need to make sure I'm doing a better job organizing these files, like you said. So it's just a quick, I can find this quickly. I can move it to wherever I need to move it. I can send it to whoever, whatever it is, uh, just creating that organization. So you've got it and you've got a system in place is so valuable to do. And it takes you a little bit of time up front, but it saves you so much money in the long term. Right. That's what I try and tell people. They're like, oh, but I don't have time to hire and train a virtual assistant. I'm like, it will on the back end, save you years of your life. If you just take an extra two, three hours, these next two, three weeks, where did you find a virtual assistant? So, um, I went through funny that, that you ask, I went through, um, a couple different companies. Um, you know, you get, you get what you pay for. Um, so I would definitely make sure that it's one where you can speak to them. It's not just over Skype or through, you know, talking and eventually, um, through Fiverr and word of mouth, found a a great woman who's been with us for almost two years now, Ruth. And then we've sourced, um, and she's in, she's in the Philippines and we've sourced, um, you know, my personal assistant. And I say funny that you're asking because the recent thing I've added to my plate is we now have a virtual assistant placement company because Ruth has such a great network and they're wonderful people that were, you know, just excited about helping get started. So I think we've placed about three, four uh, virtual assistants with that. Uh, it's called Valued Assistance Company. Um, so that is now, you know, I'm thinking I'm probably gonna have to bring on somebody else part-time. So I'll be heading to my own, my own company and seeing who we can hire for the, for the job. So um, here I will say in the U S um, I did use a great company called Chatterboss. I do want to give a shout out to, to Chatterboss, both for the girls that do their wonderful um, digital marketing. Um, and I found um, a great um, virtual assistant that I was working with for a little bit there that was helping with accounting and everything. So, um, and it's U S based. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, very hard to find a good, virtual assistant, as you mentioned, you get what you pay for. And so many people want to go super cheap on it, myself included, quite frankly. 
Um, I want to go super cheap on it. You want to get that virtual assistant that's going to be really cheap. And usually when people are cheap, there's a reason for it. It's not because they're the best in the business. Exactly. And the biggest thing too is if if you're not paying them well, they're not necessarily motivated to mm. stay with you. And then you have that pain of turnover and mm. retraining. And so Good that's point. something we try and offer is like, you know, the consistency. These are people that we know and are part of our network. And so they're dedicated to working for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good point. Good point. You can pay somebody really cheap, but as they become good or if they are good, they're going to figure that out pretty quickly when people are starting to offer them a lot more money than what you are. And that's going to cause a lot more pain to now have to go find somebody else because they decided it's not worth their time anymore. Exactly. What's a daily habit that you have? So habits. Daily, yeah. Yeah. One of my um, daily habits, um, I recently, it's newer incorporated. I uh, attended, I'm part of Go Abundance and uh, we had a seminar up in um, Sacramento and waking up and instead of sitting in my bed and going through my emails, getting outside, getting some sunlight helps with the circadian mm -hmm. rhythm, just fresh air makes me get up and move. Um, and I really feel like I'm you know, falling asleep better, waking up more naturally. Um, and my other thing is to always just find ways to incorporate exercise throughout the day. So I have a standing desk with a treadmill. And even if it's just on two and I walk, you know, for a mile, um, I feel like, especially that lunch, like that afternoon hump, that's mm -hmm. kind of my little trick besides caffeine is skip the caffeine, get some movement in or, you know, do, do the walk and talk. Um, yeah. So I would say those are, are, two habits um, that, you know, and I'm always trying to get multiple things done at once. So brushing your teeth, listen to podcasts, podcast yeah. in while you're yeah. showering. Like, you yeah. know, there's stretch. If my husband's driving, I'm stretching in the car, you know, whatever you can do, you can get, you know, and still be present and aware, but you can get a lot done. Yeah, that's true. Get, doing multiple things. As long as you're not doing two things that are very brain consuming, right? Stretching and talking fine. We can do that. Right. Uh, going for a walk and, and doing something else. Fine. We can, we can do that. Like, but yeah, if you're trying to work on your email and have a conversation, that's not going to, that's not going to go very well. We're not going to yeah. have effect. We're not going to be effective at either. Right. I love the morning, uh, just going for that walk. Uh, and I'm, I'm aging myself now I'm getting older. So, I enjoy going for walks. Uh, <laughs> I think that's that's just like as you get older, you're like, well, walk is nice. Uh, but I love getting up in the morning and just going for a walk outside in nature. And I live in Minnesota, so it's not as pleasant the whole year, but we can still make it happen for the most part, most times. Um, you know, 20 below, I'm not getting up in the morning to go for a walk, but, you know, I, I can make it happen most of the time. And I don't blame you. And I've spent some time in the Minnesota's, you know, spring, summer, and it's gorgeous. So yeah. I would definitely be getting out and walking whenever yeah. I could. So, <laughs> um, Lindsay, what's a what's a favorite book that you can recommend as listeners? You already said Who Not How. What's another one? Yeah, I think one that really for me, especially coming, you know, from where I was with finances, um, and you know, what is enough, right? What's enough in life? Um, and being somebody that likes to go, 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 like many of us probably listening to this, um, the psychology of money mm, was one that, that really, yes. And there was this quote about, you know, the hardest skill is learning not to move the goalpost and realizing, you know, we don't want to be complacent, but you are going to get to a point in life where it's okay to say like, wow, I've accomplished something mm. and I can enjoy it. And now I can grow in small ways you know, or enjoy what I've accomplished. It doesn't always have to be, oh, I have to keep going, going, going because people are going to judge me if I don't. How do you balance that of not getting complacent, but being okay with not moving the goalpost when you hit that? Because one of the things that, you know, some people love to say, hey, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to smell the roses after I, you know, get them planted and they grow. And other people are like, no, 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 no those roses grow and they're nice. Let's get some more roses, right? Let's make sure we're not complacent. Let's make sure we keep on going and growing. Otherwise you're dying. What, what do you do or what's your philosophy on that? And how are you kind of managing? 
Yeah. I think it's a mindset shift, right? Like often, and when we're getting started and we're getting young and we're that goalpost, it has to do with financial, right? Yeah. And I'm going to get here and I'm going to have that. And mine was, you know, about a month ago, I had worked hard enough and I was, I took my parents on a two week trip to Spain. Um, and it was something I got to do with them and be from my hard work. And for me, I had this realization of sitting there and I wasn't on my phone. I wasn't working. I wasn't doing deals, but being on the beach and growing in my mindfulness, my spirituality, my taking in where I was connecting with other people, being with my parents, being conscientious, you're still growing in that way. Right. Yeah. And maybe yeah. it's that goalpost stays there, but then you take a look around and you're like, okay, well, how can I grow in terms of giving back? How can I grow in my relationships? How can I grow? And I think sometimes we focus and only think that growth has to be something that the rest of the world sees and can be measured, but there's lots of other ways. And it can just be even in growth and like having more inner peace on a Sunday and not, you know, giving yourself that. Um, so I think too, we have to shift our mindset in terms of what is growth and not caring what other people think growth is. Yeah. Complacency doesn't mean you're sitting on your couch, watching TV, eating potato chips. Like that doesn't necessarily define yeah. complacency, right? It, it yeah. Complacency, or I shouldn't say complacency, maybe that is complacency, but, but not, not needing to grow, right. Or not needing to grow your business further, right. Move that goalpost. doesn't mean you're just going to sit around and just eat bonbons the rest of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Growing, we often think of like, you know, accumulating, but that doesn't yeah. have to be our definition of growth. Yeah. Love yeah. it. What's a mistake that you've made and how can our listeners learn from it? What's a one mistake? One Let's, mistake. Yeah. Maybe just, two. Just, just yeah. One. Just one. Um, I think uh, trying to do too much yeah. um, without having a system or without having, uh, you know, a coach or somebody to sound check on. Cause when I first started this, I thought I can do this. I can do it on my own. You know, I've, I've done it. I've gotten kind of, you know, lucky. And I got myself into a situation where I had um, something under contract and it was a hot deal and it was a, you know, $10,000 earnest money deposit. And then um, financially on the back end, it just wasn't going to work out for me. Now, of course, now is when I then decided I was going to reach out and try and see who can help me and what's going on. And uh, somebody had said, well, if only you had done it as, you know, Lindsay, you know, Paxton Investments and or signs, just the simple way and how you sign a contract who yep. can buy it would have allowed me to pass it on to another investor yeah. to take it over without losing my $10,000 earnest money. Um, but because I had been so determined being a straight A student, when I started off doing this, I was going to learn everything myself. I wasn't going to work with, you know, hire a mentor, a coach. I'm, you know, not going to ask questions. I'm, I can do it. Google can help me do it. Um, I lost, you know, $10,000 uh, in something that could have, you know, maybe even I could have even gotten a referral you know, fee out of it. Yeah, you might've made it. You might've made $10,000. Exactly. So it would have been 20 K ahead. Instead, you decided to do it all on your own. That's the power of hiring mentors, having people surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you. I mean, yes. we, we talk about it all the time. Like if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You should be <laughs> exactly. not the smartest person in the room. And you shouldn't, you better not be the only person in the room. So surround yourself with mentors. I love that one. Lindsay, what are, what are your three pillars, three pillars of wealth creation? Yeah. So um, I like to think, you know, the pillars that I go for that I consider wealth, time, health, and then of course there's the, the financial, because I think that can also help with giving, giving well, back. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, about time and finding ways to use money and, and create more. Um, I'm reading 10 X is better than two X. Um, and that's a little bit along those lines as well. Um, health, I think, you know, I work in cancer. Um, I think it's so easy to say, I'll get to it tomorrow. I don't have time. Um, but just prioritizing that. And I try to make what my husband and I do together is our hobbies active or things that, you know, are, are healthy and just little changes in even what you eat in your diet. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and then I just, I, I said the, well, so we've got, you know, I've got the coaching, um, still working the full, full time, um, using things like a self-directed IRA, hard money lending, all of these different ways, again, diversifying to build that wealth that can give me that, that time and relationships and being able to give back to the community. Love it. Love it. Lindsay, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the uh, insight you've given us. How can our listeners reach out and get in touch with you? Yeah. So um, I would love to connect one-on-one. Um, if you're interested in, you know, setting up a 30 minute call strategy session, thinking, you know, how can I help you or what are your next steps? You can go to millionaires, March free strategy session.com. And that is where you can connect with me. And then of course I'm on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all of the the fun social media places you can can find people these days. Love it. Love it. We'll put that in the show notes for listeners. Again, Lindsay, really appreciate it. And uh, you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoyed talking. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe, uh, give us a thumbs up, go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go to coachwithdex.com and check that out, and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.